There's an unseen battlefield in every human breast where two opposing forces meet and where they seldom rest. This is the Battle of Mobile Bay. Uh, actually, I think it's 160 years ago or 60. I don't do math well, but anyway, <laughs> uh, let's just say this is one of the most important naval battles and it features the two greatest admirals of the Civil War. Both are born in 1800. They both are Southerners. And so we're looking at the lives of David Glasgow Farragut and also Franklin Buchanan. And so I'm gonna focus more on Franklin Buchanan today, primarily because uh, I'm giving another lecture in honor of uh, Hispanic History Month about Farragut, because Farragut is the highest ranking um, Hispanic person during the Civil War, believe it or not. And his father had been born in Majorca, came to the uh, United States in uh, 1777 because he felt the patriotic spirit and he was a sea captain, but he came to Charleston and served in the South Carolina a navy and so back then various states had their own little navies like virginia had his own navy and so forth um so anyway uh, he will be born in tennessee and his family will then move to new orleans his father uh, will become a uh, part of the navy yard uh, there at new orleans and while there his mother will nurse david Dixon Porter, a uh, captain famous during the Revolutionary War. And he uh, actually um, is suffering from yellow fever. She nurses him and sadly, she catches yellow fever and she will die. And so actually at this time in his life, he is James Glasgow Farragut. And so we'll get to that because when his mother dies, the father, George, uh, his, you know, he's got 10 kids and so what is he going to do with all them? So uh, David Dixon Porter, he's known as senior during the Civil War era, but David Dixon Porter will say, well, I'll take that one, you know? <laughs> and so he will actually join the U.S. Navy at age nine, okay? And which is pretty amazing. He's a midshipman on board the USS Essex, which has a tremendous crew cruise during the War of 1812. Uh, and actually Farragut at age 12 will be commander of a prize ship. In other words, the Essex caught the ship. And so you want to take that ship back to U.S. port. Now remember, he's doing this off of Valparaiso, Chile. And so it's a long way to say that 12 years old, he's in command. And they said uh, he was about 120 pounds. 20 pounds of himself and 100 pounds of his uniform. And uh, so, you know, but they tried to mutiny on him. And so he stands them down with his sword and pistol. And he had a dirk in his mouth. I mean, this is amazing. This guy was meant for battle. And so he will, of course, um, be very fortunate in his career. I would say he serves during the Mexican War. He also is the creator of the Mare Island Navy Yard in California. And then at the time of the Civil War eruption, he is living in Norfolk. And he is married to, into the Loyal family. Uh, they don't stay loyal to the U.S. Benjamin Loyal later commands the uh, CSS Noose and is the last commander of the CSS Albemarle. So anyway. Uh, so when the war breaks out, oh my gosh, what are we going to do? Farragut is, um, uh, is asked by his stepbrother, David Dixon Porter Jr., got to get these guys all right. And so he uh, uh, says, you know, Farragut, Farragut leaves Norfolk when the war erupts and he goes up to New York City, that moves his family and everything. So David Dixon Porter will come up to him and says, well, so, um, and by the way, um, Farragut in honor of being adopted by David Dixon Porter Sr., he changes his first name to David. And so that's why he's known as David 
Glasgow Farragut. And so uh, his mother was of Scottish Oregon, ergo the Glasgow, which sometimes is spelled um, G-L-A-S-G-O-E, and sometimes it's with a W. Most people know it as a W. So anyway, uh, he's uh, an outstanding individual. His stepbrother comes up to him and says, what would you do if you were ordered to go and capture Norfolk? And Farragut said, well, I, you know, I would rather not. You know, I got a bunch of relatives there. You know, I'll do anything. He says, David Dixon Porter said, you're not the man I thought you were. And of course, Farragut, you know, stands up and points right in and says, do not trifle with me. I will take Norfolk. I'll burn Norfolk. I'll take anything. And they said, good, you're going to go get New Orleans. And so, uh, and that was just a test because many loyalties are questioned at this time in uh, the war. And so uh, basically the other person I want to talk, oh, wow, uh, there he is in a young age. Um, and uh, here he is during the Civil War. Uh, this is uh, probably taken around 65. Um, he uh, will, of uh, course, become a full admiral at the, by the end of the Civil War. We'll learn more about this. This is Franklin Buchanan, a native of Baltimore, born on September 17th, 1800 uh, in uh, Baltimore. His father was the founder of the Maryland Medical Society. His grandfather was a signer of the Declaration of Independence. 15, we, this is what we would experience. He was perhaps the most aggressive senior officer to join the Confederate Navy. His strategic flair, discipline, and heroic qualities made him respected and admired by all those around him. A typical product of old time quarterdeck and as dominantly courageous as Nelson and just as arbitrary. Ashton Ramsey thought of him. And actually, uh, John Eggleston will say that um, Buchanan is one of the grandest men who ever drew a breath of salt air. And so he will actually, um, when he is uh, in, uh, uh, of course, at the time, outbreak of the war, he is commander of the Washington Navy Yard. He had actually gone, uh, you know, he served, he was the first superintendent of the U.S. Naval Academy at Annapolis. He serves during the Mexican War, commanding the USS Germantown. He will also um, go with Matthew Galbraith Perry to Japan. He is flag captain, and he is also commander of the USS Susquehanna, which is a uh, early paddle steamer uh, that we have. Actually, Matthew Galbraith Perry is known as the father of the steam Navy. So Buchanan's connection with Perry brings him to a greater understanding of the new mode of naval warfare. And he will use that to his advantage. Like so many other officers, just like I talked about uh, Farragut, Buchanan is also troubled at the outbreak of the war. His wife is from uh, Easton, and uh, he lives in Easton. Uh, <clears throat> his farm is known as the Rest. Uh, the, so nevertheless, he will, uh, uh, this is where, when he's at the uh, Washington Navy Yard. So anyway, uh, he, uh, when Maryland looks like it's going to leave the Union, you know, on April 19, 1861, we have the Baltimore riot right down there on Pratt Street. And they're uh, actually rioting against the Massachusetts troops coming through. So Buchanan thinks well, Maryland's going to leave the Union. So he offers his resignation. And uh, Maryland doesn't leave the Union. So what does Buchanan do? He goes back to Gideon Wells. Says, oh, you know, I was a little hasty in my decision. I'd like to get my job back, basically. And uh, he says, I, I, I'm ready to serve anywhere. I'd rather not raise my sword against the Southern Brethren. And Gideon Wells says, you are dismissed from the service, right? A traitor. Uh, and so Buchanan says, oh, well, you know, I'm a free agent now. And so he joins the Confederate Navy. Um, Stephen Russell Mallory, Secretary of the Navy, will name him as head of the Office of Orders and Details. 
and but he's just waiting for the right moment because you can and uh, um, whoops, I don't want to get there yet. Um, Okay, so Buchanan uh, actually will be named commander of the James River defenses with the Virginia as his uh, flagship. And as a result of that, he on March 8, 1862, will win one of the greatest victory, the greatest Confederate naval victory uh, when the CSS Virginia emerges from the Elizabeth River. And I got to tell you, you know, they, everyone, everyone in the Union Navy is waiting for this ship to come, but they're kind of getting tired of waiting. You know, that some of them say, I wish they'd go ahead and come on out and give us a trot. Well, I have to tell you, Buchanan is pretty serious about his business. There are five capital warships here in Hampton Roads of the U.S. Navy, uh, starting at Newport News Point. We have the USS Congress. We have the USS Cumberland, then near Fort Monroe. We have the USS Roanoke, USS um, Minnesota, and we have the USS St. Lawrence. Uh, two of those are steamers. Um, they all mount a lot of guns. Now, remember, Buchanan has just 10 guns on his ship. And so when he gets to the mouth of Elizabeth River, he hails everyone on the gun deck, says, men, today we will do our duty, and not just our duty, but more than our duty. Those ships, he points at the federal fleet, says, those ships must be taken to your cannons, to your death, we will sink before surrender. Can you imagine the crew going, what? I thought this was a shakedown cruise, you know? And uh, uh, so actually, um, uh, Ashton Ramsey comes up to him uh, and says, uh, you know, Captain Buchanan, how can we do this? Uh, our ship is untried. And Buchanan merely says, uh, you know, if we sink the federal fleet, we know our ship is a success. If they sink us, we're indeed a failure. Oh, my gosh. But he proves to be amazing because he uses the ram uh, like a bayonet charge of infantry, sinks the Cumberland, sinks two merchant ships, captures another one, sinks another sailing frigate, the Congress, damages two uh, gunboats, uh, basically tugs of the Wav and the Whitehall, and then also damages the Minnesota and also the St. Lawrence. This is like unequal to anything else that happens during the Civil War. And so Buchanan, however, is so excitable. So he's on his deck. And so when they're negotiating the surrender of the Congress is burning, but uh, he gets up on top of the so-called hurricane debt or on top of the Virginia. And He's shouting orders, and, and all of a sudden, the federal soldiers on the shore are shooting at the Confederate naval personnel up against the Congress. And Buchanan says they can't fire on a white flag. He gets a musket from a Marine, starts shooting at the Union soldiers on the shore. Guess what? Uh, they shoot back, and they hit him in the leg and grievously wounding Buchanan. Um, so Buchanan will take months upon months to. Um, recover from that wound. He actually had his femur artery scratched. And so that's a very painful way to, to stop that from bleeding. I, uh, I had a couple heart surgeries and so I know the pain. So <laughs> anyway, so he is named Rear Admiral and is assigned to Mobile Bay. And there at Mobile Bay, I have to tell you, Buchanan will... Uh, Will really thrive. Uh, the, it's unbelievable the industries that are in Alabama at this time. They have iron resources, they have coal resources, they actually have several shipyards. Um, and so they're able to start to create ironclads. Well, when he gets there, nothing really is happening in any organized fashion. And the commander at the time was a man known as Victor Randolph, you know. And Victor Randolph complains that he has seniority over Buchanan. And Buchanan says, get out of the way, you old woman. And uh, whoa. <laughs> so, you know, Victor Randolph vanishes. And uh, I have to say, uh, um, it is uh, very interesting uh, how he starts to mold the fleet in Mobile Bay. He really wants to take offensive action, but he needs to have these ironclads 
uh, really finish. The first ironclad is going to be the CSS Baltic. And I have to tell you, the Baltic was a really a punk ship, as uh, its commander Charles Carroll Sims said about it. Um, and so that means that it's worthless. Actually, they'll take the armor off it to try and clad another ironclad. The first major ironclad that's going to be finished is going to be uh, the CSS Tennessee. This is called one of the most powerful ironclads during the Civil War, uh, Confederate ironclads. It will actually uh, be armed uh, with um, two seven inch Brook guns, both stern and forward, and then um, four 6.4 inch Brook guns, okay? And that means it's got a powerful battery. It's got a ram. They say its engines are the best engines in any ship built, or any ironclad built by the Confederacy. So and now they're trying to race to finish yet another one um, because what he really wants to do is uh, actually make, you know, uh, when you're in Mobile Bay, you can go out of Mobile Bay and you go down the Mississippi Sound. And so there's a bunch of coastal islands, barrier islands, and you can go down there and where do you end up? New Orleans, believe it or not. And so Buchanan knows that he can make that trip he has to have two ironclads because he's got to leave one in good old uh, Mobile Bay so that then he can strike at the others. Now, the Confederates uh, actually build um, some other ironclads, but they're underpowered. That would be the CSS Huntsville and CSS Tuscaloosa, uh, and they only go three knots, so <laughs> they're no good. Uh, one of the big troubles is getting the ships over the Mobile um, River um, bar, right? And so what will happen is when they try to take the Tennessee, you know, it, it just can't go, you know, like the bar is at high tide, nine feet, and the uh, uh, Tennessee takes more than that. And so they actually will fit with it, it with camels and which are uh, huge canvas bags and they inflate them and load it over the uh, bar. And you just imagine everything they have to do to get that ironclad in service. Um, and so um, I, I think I said four 6.4 inch book guns. It actually has two on pivot mounts so they can fire broadside um, either starboard or port. Uh, so uh, the big thing is, is that this ship um, is the hopes of the Confederacy really lay upon this ship. In fact, Buchanan will write his friend, John K. Mitchell, uh, who is commander of the James River Squadron. And he says, well, you know, he's under terrible pressure from Jefferson Davis to do something with his ironclad. And actually he writes, everybody has taken it into their heads that one ship can whip any others. And if the trial is not made, we who are in her are damned for life. Wow. So consequently, a trial must be made. And that trial is going to come uh, because David Glasgow Farragut has been given, now let's just see how good his civil war was. You know, he's already captured New Orleans by running past the forts uh, below New Orleans, Fort St. Philip and Fort Jackson. Uh, he actually uses his fleet up in the Vicksburg campaign. Uh, he will uh, actually make one big mistake at Port Hudson when he tries to run past those batteries. Uh, he uh, will be embarrassed by the CSS Arkansas when it steams past his entire fleet uh, in 1862. And so the Arkansas doesn't last long though. It gets scuttled by its own crew, but Farragut is considered, you know, the finest of the fine in the union. And so he will be given the job of going after Mobile Bay. He had said that the target, instead of taking his blue water ships up into the brown water of the Mississippi, right? He felt that they should actually go against Mobile Bay. And you have to realize after New Orleans, the major port on the Gulf of Mexico is going to be Mobile Bay. Yes, there is also 
Galveston, but it is on the wrong side of the Mississippi. So for supplying uh, the armies in Tennessee, armies in Virginia, uh, Mobile Bay becomes a rather important uh, port. So basically, uh, Farragut is going to put together a really great fleet. Um, and he says, you know, I can't attack Mobile Bay until I have ironclads. And he says, you know, uh, it's an unequal contest if I don't have them. So basically, um, in the days before, he's going to receive uh, the USS Manhattan, which is a kind of class, um, class uh, monitor, um, and then also um, he gets two twin turreted monitors, the Winnebago and the Chickasaw. Oh my gosh, and right before the attack comes, the last ship that joins is going to be the Tecumseh. And uh, so basically his ideal, uh, the conditions on August 4th or 5th, are perfect for his attack. Number one, he has uh, the wind blowing from the Southwest, which blows all his smoke across the, uh, uh, the Confederate fort. The main Confederate fort is of course um, right uh, there, which is of course, um, uh, well, no, excuse me. I was looking at this map wrong, right? Um, there is Fort Morgan, this is Fort Gaines over there. So they have a pilings and a torpedo field that leaves a very narrow entrance into Mobile Bay. So Farragut's going to attack this with the interior column of the Tecumseh, Manhattan, Winnebago, and the Chickasaw. They're supposed to deal with the Confederate ironclad, the Tennessee. Now, his other wooden ships are going to be tied together. This is the outer uh, column. The first ship in line is commanded by James Alden, and he has command of the USS Brooklyn. And Brooklyn has at its bow this torpedo catcher uh, that was invented by John Erickson. It was very bad. You know, it was hard to steer your vessel. It, it you know, just was not very effective in grapples and all these other things on it. And so the Brooklyn was tied to the Arcatora. Then came the Hartford, which is tied to the Metacomet. Then comes the Richmond, uh, which is tied to the Port Royal. Lackawanda is then tied to the, uh, the Seminole. Mongahelia is going to be lashed to the Kennebec and the Ossipee with the Estaca. And then the Oneida is tied to the Galena. Now, you all remember the Galena used to be an ironclad. It was such a punk ironclad that what did they do? They took the armor off of it. And, and so they still kept it in the U.S. Navy and is here at Mobile Bay. Why does he last these ships together? Primarily because if one ship is disabled, you have the other ship to keep the, the, the vessel in line, keep it moving. They're always very worried about shots through the boiler. Right, and that happens at um, Port uh, Hudson, and uh, so you know that's why he has these two columns, and you can see them uh, in this map right here as they come in. Now, this is Fort Morgan. Uh, it is a pre-war third system coastal defense work uh, made of bricks. Uh, it has a water battery. Um, it is, and this is the CSS Tennessee. Um, now, just imagine being in this ship in the summer in Mobile Bay, and no wonder they have the awnings. Uh, so, uh, <laughs> you know, the, this is the Tennessee, though. It is actually a very powerful ship. Um, as I said, it has a ram. It's got port shutters. Uh, it is, uh, has six inches of iron forward, uh, and... Uh, so that means it's very well armored. It makes five knots. So it's a pretty good ironclad, I think. Ah, here's the Hartford. This is the flagship of uh, Farragut. Uh, and uh, actually, if you come to the museum, you can see several items from the Hartford on display. Uh, and uh, 
So uh, there he is, Farragut, with next to him, to the right, is Percival Drayden. Uh, Drayden is uh, his flag captain and commander of the, um, of the uh, Hartford. So anyway, uh, this uh, Alden is uh, leading the charge in. So what does he do? Now, he's coming in on a flood tide that gives him greater speed. He's got this breeze that's blowing the gun smoke away from his ships and onto the fort. So that confuses the fort's aim. And so this becomes a very good tactic. Um, and so when they uh, uh, come in, into Mobile Bay, I have to say the Fort Morgan opens up on it and the Tennessee is going to get ready and Buchanan addresses his men. And he says, now men, the enemy is coming. And I want you to do your duty and you shall not have it to say that when you leave this vessel, that you were not near enough to the enemy for I will meet them. And you, then you can fight alongside of their own ships. And if I fall, lay me on one side and go on with the fight and never mind me, but whip and sink the Yankees or fight until you sink yourselves, but do not surrender. You can match this guy. I mean, sink before surrender is the, <laughs> one of my favorite lines. Uh, anyway, um, and so uh, you can see how they are crowding in through the channel. Now, um, so this is the narrow channel coming in. This area up here is called the Anchorage. That's the destination that Farragut wants to get to by running past these forts. And so basically, as they near um, Fort Morgan, um, this is the, one of the most dramatic points of the Civil War. Uh, I have to tell you, the Tecumseh is coming inside the wooden ship column. It, the tide is so strong, it moves it in a way that takes it right over the torpedo field. And when it gets over the torpedo field, guess what? A uh, torpedo goes off um, and the Tecumseh is going to sink in 90 seconds. Captain Tunis Craven is actually uh, going to be getting ready to go up the ladder to get out of the turret. And the pilot comes and is after you, Mr. Pilot. And so the pilot gets out. Craven does not. He dies. He goes down with his. And so you can see. Uh, um, how this was so dramatic, it stopped the Union fleet dead in its tracks because Alden did not want to go over the torpedo field. And he basically stops his ship and you know, Farragut, who's hell bent for leather, is going to you know, say, what's going on here? You know? And uh, he shouts several words, they, they get this quote, There's, about 10 different ways to do this quote. Um, but uh, I have to say, uh, uh, he, the, when the Brooklyn stops, Farragut says, you know, damn, feet ahead. And there are other things he says, but that's the, the, the main quote anyway that you get. So uh, uh, this is the Tecumseh. So 20, only 21 men survived the sinking of the ship. Um, and there he is. He goes up in the yard arm, right, uh, and up into the rigging to so he can see over the battlefield. Drayden says, oh, my gosh, if he gets wounded or he slips, he's going to be down in the water. So he gets lashed <laughs> into the rigging. So if he gets shot, you know, at least he's not going to fall in the water. And uh, uh, so because he's but he wants to be able to direct his fleet in a tremendous way. Now, uh, when the Brooklyn stops, Farragut doesn't care. He goes around the uh, Brooklyn and he actually goes through the torpedo field. And the men say they could hear the snapping of the primers on the torpedoes beneath the ship. However, none of them blow up. They've been in the water too long. And I can't believe in the sound of battle they could say that, but they could hear it, but that's what they said. And so, anyway. Um, this is a, uh, uh, so there's Farragut. Um, and this is the damage done to Fort Morgan during the fight. Um, and as they pass, it will later be besieged. But um, 
Uh, you can see this is uh, four tiers of weapons. You see the casemates, one, two, three, and then you had guns and parapet on top. Then in front of this, you had a so-called water battery where the guns were placed and parapet. Uh, they have 15, 10 inch uh, Columbiads, two seven inch brook guns in that water battery. So that's pretty good. <gasps> Buchanan, right? Now, Buchanan, when he sees the federal fleet come in, he wants to go and attack them. He thinks, I'm going to ram one of those forward wooden ships, and that will stop the fleet dead in its tracks. But the trouble is, is that, you know, his ship only goes five knots. So the federal ships just go right by him. <laughs> he, he can't do anything about it. He shoots at them. Uh, but that makes him hopping mad. Uh, and uh, uh, I have to say that uh, uh, Buchanan uh, uh, will then, uh, I think uh, he realizes the federal fleet and it comes into what is called the anchorage, um, which I showed you in a map. And they then have breakfast, right? Uh, uh, Farragut thinks everything's fine. In fact, before they go into battle, Drayden says uh, to Farragut, don't you think we should give them some whiskey? And he goes, no whiskey for them. They get cold coffee like I have. And, you know, he's like, oh, my gosh. And so once again, Drayden says, oh, yeah, with their breakfast, don't you think they should have some whiskey? And he goes, not coffee, you know. So uh, I, I have to say, Buchanan, on the other hand, he missed his opportunity. And so he did not wish to scuttle his vessel. He did not, he would not surrender his vessel. So he tells the uh, captain of the Tennessee, uh, Commander James Johnson, to move against Farragut's fleet. One seaman uh, commented, it looked to me that we cause a death. Dr. Conrad, the ship's surgeon, was shocked and asked Buchanan, are you going into that fleet, Admiral? Buchanan says, I am, sir. Conrad then says, will never come out of their hole. The Admiral overheard that comment and told Dr. Conrad, that's my lookout, sir, as if to say, we're going to sink them or we're going to sink. Uh, and when Farragut sees the Tennessee coming towards it, uh, all he says, I did not think old Buck would be such a fool. And so, but Farragut uh, said, you know, get his ships ready. And his concept was to try to ram the Tennessee as best it could. Um, so basically, um, the entire fleet uh, is six guns versus 147 guns. Okay, I just want to get that understood. Um, and um, so basically, um, the Mongahelia tries to uh, ram the uh, Tennessee, and um, it was... Uh, passed right by it, and he ordered the men on the gun deck, Johnson did, study yourselves, stand by. And then the Mongahela is going to strike the ironclad, uh, which knocked many of the men down on the gun deck. Oh, my gosh. We are all right, uh, nevertheless, because they survived that ramming. And so that made him feel good, uh, according to Conrad, Dr. Conrad. Um, now, then... Uh, the Lackawanda is going to ram the uh, Tennessee, and the Tennessee was healed over. You know, in other words, pushed his back like this, uh, which is very bad. And they also, the sailors that could look right into the casemates, right, of the uh, CSS Tennessee. And so they throw... Um, <laughs> They throw holly stone and spit tunes at the Tennessee uh, through the gun port. And uh, actually, a Confederate sailor thrust his bayonet into a Yankee blue jacket, believe it or not. And the end result of this close fighting was that one of the Tennessee's gun ports was ran by a shot from Lackawanda. Farragut then ordered the Hartford to ram the Tennessee. It was almost a head on collision and uh, which would have sank both ships more likely. Uh, and alongside each other, this, this is this moment, okay? You see Farragut up there, you see Drayden up there. Actually, Drayden um, will uh, 
look into through the gun port and see Buchanan. And he throws his binoculars at him saying, you infernal traitor. And so uh, Buchanan didn't care. Yeah. Now Buchanan uh, now had the big trouble. The Lackawanda tries to ram again. Instead, it misses. And guess what it does? It hits the Hartford right where standing Farragut. And it cracks the hull down to the water's edge, believe it or not. So, and uh, Farragut says, get out of my way. You know, just rough. Yeah, these guys were tough, I have to tell you. And uh, so <clears throat> what's going to happen now is the turn of the monitors. So basically, USS Manhattan approached with its um, two 15-inch shell guns. Lieutenant Arthur Wharton, who was a gun captain on board the Tennessee, when a hideous monster came creeping up on our port side, whose revolving turret revealed the cavernous depths of a mammoth gun. Stand clear of the port side, he shouted, and then a thundering report, uh, while a blast of dense sulfuric smoke covered our portholes and 440 pounds of iron impelled by 60 pounds of powder, admitted daylight through one side. In other words, they, the Federals figured out that a 15 inch gun was a Confederate ironclad killer. So right away, you have the casemate cracked, broken, sunlight's coming in. So that's, Buchanan has a um, netting put up so the splinters would not damage some of the crew members. But still this is, uh, um, the Manhattan is the only one 15, it's 15 inch guns, the only one that penetrates uh, the um, sides of the Tennessee. Now what goes on now is another Tennessee or another ironclad comes up, the twin turreted river monitor Chickasaw. Now it has two, no, four 11 inch Dahlgren guns. And so it positions itself right off of the Tennessee and begins firing, actually will pump 52 shells or shot into the Tennessee. And the Confederate ironclad, and this is a range from, according to Wharton, of 12 feet to 50 feet away. So you can well imagine that this ship is getting pounded. Uh, its steering chains are going to be uh, cut. Uh, actually, its funnel will be so badly shot up that it will collapse. So number one, I can't steer anywhere. Number two, I can't, uh, I can't keep steam up in my engine. So I'm in trouble. And so um, he wants to keep his bat ship into fight. And so two mechanics with their backs to the casemate while held a bolt as two more struck at it using sledgehammers. They got a, the, the port shutters got jammed. And so they got to open them up so we can fire our guns. Well, Buchanan, goes over and supervise them, you know? And uh, so the Chickasaw will fire a shot that hits the casemate right where the port shutters are. And it says the two men with their back to the casemate disappear, right? Um, bolts from the casemate bounce inside the uh, Tennessee, one of which hits Buchanan. Oh my gosh. In fact, he is badly wounded um, and uh, uh, he suffered a compound complex fracture to his left leg. It was bent out in a strange angle, according to Dr. Conrad. And Conrad asked Buchanan, Admiral, are you badly hurt? Buchanan simply is why? I don't know. I don't care. Um, so, uh, you know, uh, Conrad then knew that he could not treat the Admiral on the deck. So he puts him on his back and takes him down into the hull of the ship so he can work on him. And Conrad will say, as he's taking him down, the left leg flaps. <laughs> and Buchanan doesn't care, you know. Um, um, remember what he said? If I am wounded, lay me down to the side and keep on fighting. So, um, so his broken leg uh, just really upset Conrad because he could go only so fast. 
and it, that leg, every step he took, bounced off his side. Well, uh, Commander Johnson then came to see Buchanan, and um, the badly injured flag officer stoically told the ship's captain, well, Johnson, they have got me again. You'll have to look out for her now. It is all your fight. But remember, to sink before surrender. Oh my gosh. The, you know, this ship is being pounded and he's down below and his legs being treated. And so the, basically as Johnson goes back up to the gun deck, this ship is a rambling wreck. Uh, it once again, can't steer. It, it can't get power up. Uh, it's gun ports are jammed. And so, you know, it's a helpless wreck. So uh, Johnson keeps it in action for a little while, but he then will say um, that um, the smokestack had been shot off so that the engines had no draft and the gun deck filled with suffocating fumes and heat. Tennessee, furthermore, was unable to defend itself. Primers were faulty and most of the guns unable to fire because of jammed port covers. Johnson went back down to see Buchanan and uh, he says, look, this, we're in bad shape. And Buchanan then says, do the best you can, sir. And when all is done, surrender. And the only time he's said something like that. And so I have to say that the Tennessee will surrender. And the Battle of Mobile Bay is over by 1030 in the morning. It's uh, three and a half hours of fighting. Uh, it's one of the most fiercest battles, naval battles of the, the Civil War, I have to say. And it comes at a time when um, the nation needed some cheering up. Just remember, this is August of 1864. Uh, what's happening? Uh, Grant is besieging uh, Lee at Petersburg. He's lost by this time, almost 65,000 men, uh, casualties. Um, Sherman is trying to get at Atlanta, but can't. So this is the first major victory for the North in the summer of 64. And this victory is so important because it gives uh, a, a, light, a light of fresh air to the Union. Actually, Lincoln was lamenting that he was not going to get reelected and uh, had created a plan to how to transfer power to his opponent, who was George McClellan. And so I have to say the Buchanan's ability to um, sink uh, the Congress and Cumberland and his dynamic flair during battles uh, was very impressive. In fact, it's a model for many to follow. Likewise of David Glasgow Farragut. They are both models for naval officers still today uh, because of their bravery and dedication. And, you know, they take Buchanan, I'll just tell you the story. Uh, they take Buchanan to Pensacola Navy Yard, which had been captured by the Federals in 62. And he's in the hospital there. And one of the surgeons comes up to Buchanan and says, you know, your leg is very badly injured and, you know, we might need to take it off. What would you like us to do? And Buchanan typically says, you captured it, you decide. <laughs> so, you know, wow. So anyway, uh, that's uh, the Battle of Mobile Bay. Uh, it is an intricate engagement that actually everyone who fought in it, in fact, sailors that survived the battle, would actually um, tell people, well, I was at Mobile Bay and they all would realize, you know, how terrible it was. Uh, one man went and tried to raise money because during the battle, he uh, threw his arms up and his arms were shot off with a cannonball. And then another cannonball comes and takes off his legs. I was there at Mobile Bay to save the nation. Uh, so anyway, and that's the Battle of Mobile Bay. Um, advance, advance on a bit there. Oh, whoa, whoa, whoa. I love that painting. Uh, so, you know. Um, we work hard on these slides. I don't want you to miss them. Now, we will hear more about Farragut from John in September. Hope you'll join us for that lecture as part of our heritage. Um, Hispanic Heritage Month. I'm sorry, it just flew out, but 
anyway, um, we hope you'll join us for that lecture. And also um, we're gonna have some questions now from um, online first, Stephanie, and then we'll, now my mic's on, right? Yeah, sorry. Um, Stephanie, let's start with an online question and then we'll have questions from, from the room here. Got it. Scott from Fredericksburg, Virginia asks, did Farragut ever visit Buchanan and the Union Hospital after the battle? No. Okay then. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, uh, he actually um, is, um, goes on leave and goes back to New York where he's fitted and his command is taken over by Rear Admiral Thatcher. Uh, so uh, who can maintains because see the town city of Mobile does not fall it, as a result of this battle. And so what's going to happen is that they have to continue to operate against it until May of 1865 when the town surrenders Spanish Fort, which you can visit. Actually, if you go down to Mobile Bay, uh, you can stand in front of Fort Morgan and you look right like just like that. And about 50 yards away is this buoy that marks the grave of the crew of the Tecumseh. I mean, it's like awe-inspiring. Do we have a question from anyone in the room? Yes, sir. Maybe I missed it, Maybe I missed it but uh, what part did uh, Porter play? He was not there. Porter at this time um, is going to replace uh, uh, S.P. Lee as commander of the North Atlantic Blockading Squadron. And so he is now commander of the North Atlantic Blockading Squadron. This is the West Gulf Squadron that Farragut commands. So um, yeah. they're not any, they, they serve together during New Orleans and he actually has to have some harsh words with his stepbrother because his stepbrother was in command of the mortar fleet and that was bombarding uh, Fort Jackson and Fort St. Philip. And Farragut says, you know, you're taking too much time and are you really doing damage? And it turns out they get spotters up in a tree and you know, red flag, you got a hit, and white flag, you missed. There were only like three or four red flags. Oftentimes the mortar shells would go right into the mud of the Fort Parade field and be, you know, har it's harmless. Uh, so uh, the mortar boats are considered by Farragut as unnecessary for victory. Stephanie, do we have an online question? We'll come back to you, Tom. Yes, Mo from Hershey, Pennsylvania asks, when the Union wooden ships were tied together, which captain was designated in the command of fire and maneuver? Well, it would be the largest ship. And so uh, uh, like um, uh, the Brooklyn, the Hartford, they all took the leadership role because they're much bigger ships. And so uh, they're lashed together primarily because if someone's engine is damaged that they still can get out of the line of fire if necessary. Can't keep his leg. Yes. Good decision on that surgeon. Right? Yeah, what's so funny is that uh, yeah, he does keep his leg. He's still on crutches and he becomes uh, president of the, what's now known as the University of Maryland. He's the founding president. So you can say about Buchanan, he founds two universities that are leading in America. Well, he tries to run this university as a ship Right, and, and so the professors don't like it, the students don't like it. So after years, he quits, he goes sells insurance down in Mobile Bay, and then he retires in 1871 to his farm, The Rest, outside of Eastern Maryland. The name, the rest. That's great. Yeah, I've been there. Stephanie, an online question? Yes, Ray from Southeast Michigan asks, is the to come some still on the bottom of the Mobile Bay? And if so, are there any plans for it to be raised? Um, there are no plans to raise it. Actually, it's still there. It's actually not in Mobile Bay. It's at the entrance to Mobile Bay, technically. It's, uh, and that's a real technical point, but uh, uh, they did a Smithsonian organized expedition to bring up the, um, the pilot house 
which sat on top of the turret. Um, but this is back in the very early 1950s, and they had perfected how to take care, conserve iron once in water. So it kind of fell into dust, believe it or not. So, uh, and no other efforts were made to try and bring that ship up. It's not that in deep of water, but um, it's in the main shipping channel. And so that really uh, makes it uh, difficult to mount the type of effort uh, that we have to you know, bring the monitor here to the Mariner's Museum. Uh, they're off Cape Hatteras, no one cares there. Uh, <laughs> I went there with them, but uh, you know. Uh, we care. We care, I care, care. I care. <laughs> um, Stephanie, is there another yes. online question? Yes, Fernando from Venezuela. Um, acts the victories of Sherman in Atlanta and Sherilyn at Cedar Creek helped Lincoln to win the elections in November. But how much did Mobile Bay to reach his reelection? Well, Mobile Bay is the start of the string of victories that the Federals are going to have. You have to realize that the fall of Atlanta is in September. 1864, uh, Battle of Cedar Creek, October of 1864. And actually the commander of the Confederate Army, Jubal Anderson Early, had actually in July raided Washington, DC. You know, they uh, uh, fight a battle called the Battle of Monarch Sea in Maryland, uh, near Frederick, Maryland. And uh, they actually come within sight of uh, Fort Stevens, which is uh, the perimeter forts protecting Washington. So uh, Sheridan, uh, you know, was told stop that, and he stopped that. And so that was you know, this, this is October of '64. So you got three major victories: victories at sea, victory on land, victories capturing a major Confederate industrial center, destroying a Confederate army that had been a pest since 1861 in the Shenandoah Valley. So that's really important. Any questions from in the room? Otherwise, we'll go back to you, Steph. Yes. For online questions. Okay, Scott asks, were there any black crewmen on the CSS Tennessee? Um, none that I know of. Um, there were, there was one on the uh, Albemarle, I uh, know, um, and uh, the Hartford. Uh, the yeah. Hartford had several, in fact. Uh, they were in that uh, painting earlier. Yes, and I can't get the slides back to that. So uh, sorry, but yes. Um, and uh, so basically, you see a, a black man, a gunner, um, manning 11 inch Dahlgren on pivot mount right when it's right next to the Tennessee. Uh, so uh, I think there are four Medal of Honors that are going to be given to um, the uh, uh, crew members of the, someone knows what they're doing. Thank you, Aaron. <laughs> so anyway, yeah, it's, um, uh, so, uh, and, and they were shell fitters. And uh, uh, so I gave a lecture last February, I think, about um, Naval Medal of Honor recipients. Yes. And uh, I talked about all the men on the African Americans on the uh, uh, USS Hartford. Generally speaking, about 10 to 20% of a crew would be African American. Um, so uh, especially the gunboats that are serving down in the uh, South. Um, and uh, uh, so I have to say that it is, this there, is, this, so you the can foreground. see the foreground, the gunner there, um, he's waiting to do his duty. They're swabbing it there. He's going to step in when they put in a shell and powder and ram it down. So, uh, that's a very thrilling scene. Yes. The question Not, was, uh, did Hartford have chain armor? No. Really, that was developed by uh, John Winslow for the Kearsarge, and he really cheated because um, I think they did put some chains down. They did that at New Orleans as well, and they only did it where you have to, you're protecting your boiler as best possible. 
Uh, the uh, Winslow on the Kearsarge, however, he is going to not only put all these chains down, he puts planking over it so you don't think it is an ironclad when actually it is. And so Raphael Sims, commander of the Alabama, said that Winslow cheated. Uh, and, and actually they had been cabin mates during the Mexican war on board the USS Summers and survived the sinking of the summer. I, the I, lecture coming is that on lecture the coming? summers, yes, um, later this fall. Um, really? John, keep going there with you. <laughs> I know, I just, we want to see the, um, so people can contact you. Hey, you hey, if, hey. If hey. we don't get to all the questions, but we do have a few more. Um, <laughs> Stephanie. Confederate forts preserved. Um, yes, um, I have done that before, believe it or not. I was going to say, it sounds like uh, something you've done, times. John. And uh, uh, so I go to downtown Mobile Bay. Mobile, the city, is actually uh, created by the French. So it has a French section, then controlled by the Spanish, then uh, the Brits for a little bit. And uh, uh, then, of course, we take over. Uh, after the War of 1812. So in essence, um, uh, Mobile has a Spanish fort, um, which is on the Blakely River, um, which is guarding the Eastern approach to Mobile Bay. Then you drive 30 miles around the bay and you get to Fort Morgan. And the last time I went there was right after Katrina. And so the ferry wasn't working. So we couldn't go to Dolphin Island uh, and see Fort Gaines. Uh, it's preserved. Um, in fact, they're having an event there this weekend, a living history thing. Uh, then you also have Fort Powell, and, which is guarding Grant's Pass, which is another way to get into Mobile Bay. And so all those forts still stand today. Fort Morgan, is the one, if you can only go one place, that's where you want to go. Because number one, it's right, there. I mean, you can understand the total battle by standing there. And you can really have the feeling of the Tecumseh, how that just stopped the battle. Xantha Smith did this one painting that you could just see how the, the, the impact of the sinking of the Tecumseh has on everyone there. Uh, there's no cheering. It's just shock and awe. Stephanie says we have two more questions yes. from online. Tom asks, what books about this battle would you recommend? Well, <laughs> dare I say it? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think I cover it very nicely in my book about CSS Virginia because Buchanan is there. And... Um, so I did a biography of every crew member of the Virginia. And, it's for sale uh, in the gift shop. In the gift shop, yeah. Okay, Which thanks for that. <laughs> and uh, uh, so it gives a good account of the battle. And it's also in my book, uh, A History of Ironclads. Um, I, uh, if you read my blog, which I don't think is up yet, but it will be, uh, I, uh, the battle is actually covered by Dr. Conrad in an amazing way. You know, he's an eyewitness. Also, James Johnson writes about the battle. Uh, Percival Drayden writes about the battle. Mm -hmm. uh, Lieutenant Alfred, Albert uh, Wharton writes about the battle. So these are all in um, battles, battles and Leaders of the Civil War series by Century Magazine. But they are awesome accounts. <clears throat> and so... Uh, 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 Dr. Conrad, uh, you know, he sees it all happening and uh, his tale about Buchanan is, uh, I, I shudder when, uh, when I first read it, I go, oh my God, the guy's crazy, really crazy. And then I said, how could Conrad tolerate taking a man down below with the leg flapping against his leg? I mean, I, it just, it's a picture uh, I just can't conceive. Okay. Yeah. I'm glad I told that story. Yes, one more. Peter asks, if the Tecumseh had not been lost, do you think with her 
twin 15 inch guns, she will have outgunned the Tennessee. Well, the Tennessee was already outgunned uh, by the Manhattan who had two uh, 15 inch guns. So a 15 inch gun we know is an ironclad killer. Uh, 15 inch shells destroy, uh, cause the Atlanta to surrender. 15 inch shells uh, will uh, actually cause the Tennessee to surrender. And uh, unfortunately, the Federals did not have uh, 15 inch guns on the North Carolina sounds and that enables the Albemarle to be such a success. Um, so I have, I think I wrote a blog about Will, that. Well, I think you have a YouTube moment. I may do have that you as well. Back I don't on know. Our YouTube <laughs> channels uh, and just search for Civil I War. I can't John remember has half the things. Many, uh, many written. things. Um, <laughs> But, but we thank all of you for being with us today. I want to remind you next, um, or August 19th, John will be speaking about um, Brigadier General Billy Mitchell, the uh, founder of the US Air Force, who was an army man. Um, and we have many ties to him here in Hampton Roads. Um, Billy Mitchell Airport at Frisco is my favorite spot to think about Billy Mitchell, down on the Outer Banks. Um, so John will be speaking of that on the day of the founding, National Aviation Day, excuse me. Um, I that, plan these lectures yes, for we, you. Yes, we kind of do. We <laughs> kind of. kind of look at the ca uh, calendar, don't we? Um, and in September, as we've said, Farragut will be uh, covered as well. Tomorrow from 10 to 3 here in the museum, if you're local and can get to us, we have... Uh, a day full of activities focused on the uh, turret recovery of Monitor 20 years ago. Um, at 11 o'clock, John Broadwater, another author about the Monitor, will be giving a lecture. And then at one o'clock, Will Hoffman, our uh, chief conservator and director of conservation, will be talking about the conservation of Monitor. So those are two lectures. They will not be taped for those of you out there, we're sorry to say, but that we hope you'll be here and can join us. Um, and I'll be here. John will be here uh, and I'll be here. And so we're, a lot of people will be here tomorrow. We'd love to see you all. And we look forward to your joining us next time. And I just want to remind you all, as the mortal words of Franklin <laughs> Buchanan, sink before, before surrender. surrender. Yay. <laughs>